Welcome to our review on osmosis. So previously we've already looked at the process of diffusion and now we're coming on to our second process which is called osmosis. And again the first thing we need to do here is understand what we mean by the word osmosis. So our definition is the movement of water molecules from an area of high water potential to an area of lower water potential. And this happens across a selectively permeable membrane. Just like diffusion, we could always describe this as those water molecules are actually moving down a concentration gradient. But do make sure that you've learnt that definition and remember that osmosis is only the movement of water. So in our definition, we use this phrase water potential. Now, what we're actually referring to there is the concentration of free water molecules. In the two pictures I've given you there with my amazing drawing skills, you'll notice that on the left, we've got our low water potential. So basically, we've got some kind of solute in the middle and then joined onto that, we've got some of those water molecules, leaving only a very small number which are free. Whereas on the right, we have a high water potential where all of the water molecules are free. So make sure you understand that water potential is just the concentration of free water molecules. Now, what we actually find as a standard pattern that we will see in terms of osmosis is that if we have a greater difference in water potential between our two areas, then the rate of osmosis is going to be greater or faster. So when we actually come on to apply what we see when osmosis occurs in different settings, the first one we need to consider is what happens in plant cells. So if you remember from B1, the structure of our plant cell, around the outside, we've got that cell wall made of cellulose, which is that rigid structure that gives it that support. Now, this is vital when we're thinking about osmosis in plant cells. So if we take our plant cell and place it into a solution that has the same concentration as the contents inside the cell, what we actually see is that water is entering the cell at the same rate that it leaves. So basically the cell remains the same. It won't change in mass or length. You'll see no difference because it's leaving at the same rate as the water is entering. And that's what you see in the middle there if you go straight down. The second scenario is if we place our plant cell in some kind of a solution where we've got a higher water potential. So this would be placing it into something like uh, distilled water, for example. So because that's got a really high concentration of these free water molecules, compared to the inside of that plant cell, the water is going to move into the plant cell. And as a result of that, what we see is that it starts to swell. Now, because it's swelling up, what we find is that the pressure inside the cell is going to increase, and that's called turgor pressure. So when the cell is all full of water, it's pressing out against that cell wall, we have what's called a turgid cell. So it's literally packed full of water, but it doesn't burst because it's got that cell wall. The last example on the right hand side of our diagram there is if we place our plant cells into a more concentrated solution. So one with a lower water potential than the contents of our cell itself. And what we see here is because we've obviously got that lower water potential in the solution than in the plant cell, water moves from the plant cell to the solution. So what we see is water is lost from those plant cells. As a result of that, the turgor pressure is going to fall and the cell then becomes flaccid. So it goes a little bit floppy and droopy. What we actually find is that if that situation continues and we keep drawing that water out, then eventually that actual cell membrane pulls away from the cell wall and we end up with what's called a plasmalized cell. And that's what you can see in the diagram there where the cell membrane's pulled in and all of the contents has basically collapsed. If we now consider what happens with the exact same situations, but changing our plant cells for animal cells, then we get very different scenarios. So we'll start with the one that goes straight down the middle again. So we're going to place our red blood cells in this case in a solution that's got the same concentration as inside that cell. So the water enters at the same rate that it leaves. Therefore, no net movement of water. Everything remains the same. 
if we place our red blood cells in a higher water potential solution, so one that's less concentrated, things like distilled water again, then what happens there is the water is going to move from the higher water potential, the solution, to the lower water potential, which is our red blood cell. So our red blood cells take in water. Now that means that it's actually going to swell up, but because it has no cell wall, it keeps swelling until it actually bursts. And when those cells burst, that's a process called lysis. On the right hand side, we can see our last scenario, which is where we've placed our red blood cells into a more concentrated solution. So one with a lower water potential than the inside of the cell. And what we see there is that the water moves from the cells to the surroundings. And therefore what happens is it actually starts to shrivel up and it becomes what's called crenated. And that just means it's all wrinkled up. So now we understand the theory behind osmosis, hopefully you will carry out an experiment in lessons. Now the experiment you would have done on osmosis was probably using little chips of potato which you placed into different solutions. Now what you'd have done before you placed the potato into those solutions is you'd have recorded the initial mass or in some cases you may have actually measured the length of them. Then you left them for a couple of hours, came back, reweighed them or re-recorded the length and worked out the difference as a result of that. Now, what we will actually find there is that there's a whole range of questions they could ask you here because our osmosis practical is one of those assessed practical tasks. So one of their favourites could very well be about accuracy. So they could ask you why it's better to record the change in mass rather than a change in length. So if you just think logically, length only measures one dimension of the potato chip. It's not measuring the width or the depth and how that's changing. So the change in mass is a more accurate measure for that reason. And what we tend to do, as opposed to just saying the starting mass was this and the end mass was this, here's the difference. What we actually do is work out the percentage change in mass. And to do that, you do your final result minus the initial. And don't worry if it comes out as a negative number, that's absolutely fine. And then you divide that by your initial mass. Once you've got it, you times it by 100 because it is a percentage change. The key thing if they ask you to calculate these is make sure you include the plus or the minus sign because that's vitally important here in interpreting the results. If it's got a plus, that means it's gained in mass, so water's moved in. If, however, it's got a minus sign, then that means it's lost mass, so water has moved from your potato cells to the surrounding solution. If they ask you to plot a graph, then there will be a point where it crosses your X axis. So you'll have some results that are positive, others that are negative, and there will be a certain point on there where it's going to cross your X axis. And where that happens, that tells you the concentration within the potato chips themselves, because there's no net change in mass, which means the same amount of water is leaving as entering which if you remember our theory tells us that that is the concentration inside our potato.